All right. Um, so welcome back to our final session about botnet takedowns, which we've previewed a little bit already. Uh, let me just really quickly introduce our panelists, and then I'll give you a quick overview of how we're going to spend the time. Um, Richard Boscovich, uh, Assistant General Counsel at Microsoft in the Digital Crimes Unit. Uh, I think it's fascinating that he began his career as a corporate tax attorney, and it just shows you there's hope even for the guys who are into tax law. Uh, after that, he served for many years as a, an AUSA in Miami, which I can only imagine how interesting that got. Uh, and during that time, he served as the district's computer hacking in, in the computer hacking and IT unit. Uh, Kristen Eikenser from UCLA, um, who researches and teaches in this area, previously served as special assistant to the legal advisor of the State Department. And so in addition to understanding the domestic uh, perspective on these issues, she also has a great handle on the international law perspective as well. Uh, also clerked for uh, both O'Connor and Sotomayor in the Supreme Court, which is very cool. Uh, Kristen's left, and your, your viewpoint right, Greg Nojan from the Center for Democracy and Technology where he's the Senior Counsel and Director of the Freedom, Security, and Technology Project. Uh, Greg's been at the center of all the great, uh, what I would describe as the, le the legislative battles that implicate technology, surveillance, and, uh, and privacy, uh, from most recently the uh, CISA and USA Freedom from a few months back, going back to uh, the Patriot Act in the fall of 2001. I was reminiscing with him last night. That was right when I was trying to get hired into my first academic job. And uh, I think I just quoted, maybe without attribution, a lot of things you said and got hired. So thank you, Greg. <laughs> uh, and then last but not least, Sean Farrell from the FBI, who is the chief of FBI's, uh, the Office of General Counsel at FBI's uh, cyber law unit, famously known as OGC SILU. Is that how it's pronounced? That's correct. SILU. So there you go. You got something you learned today. <laughs> Uh, so in addition to being in the thick of these types of, uh, these takedown operations, uh, Sean previously served as Assistant General Counsel and an Intelligence Analyst supporting the Counterterrorism Division. So we have a, we have a great uh, mix of perspectives here. What we're going to do is start with a, a discussion about <coughs> some of the practical aspects of botnets. First of all, let's make sure that we're all roughly on the same page. I mean, many people in this room, of course, know this stuff extremely well. We're going to talk about what exactly a botnet is, um, how they're created in the first instance, how they're controlled, what they're used and or sold for, what the market's like, and then how they're, how they're detected. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the history of the private sector and the government both learning how to respond to this and learning to interact with each other in doing so. And, and we might look over the horizon a little bit about what technological change might mean for this particular type of threat. Uh, if we haven't already gotten into it, we'll then get into the legal architecture of a takedown. And we'll, we'll unpack the details, who's doing what, who has which roles, who's paying for what, and what goes wrong, perhaps, or what might go wrong. What are some of the downsides of the status quo of the way things are being done? And are, are there broader implications, especially in relation to public-private partnerships? And then finally, we will get to the question of what are some of the, the leading uh, Proposals for reform of the architecture, um, such as proposals to modify Rule 41 of the Rules of Criminal Procedure, um, some legislative ideas that were floated in connection with CISA but, but did not come to fruition, but no doubt will appear again at some point. So we have a lot to talk about, but we're still going to stop at the top of the hour because, well, because you'll probably all leave at 5 o'clock <laughs> anyways, and we don't want to be in here talking to just the camera, although we love all of you who are watching, so thank you for watching. <laughs> So without further ado, um, let, let's start with some, someone on the panel just introduce the room to the concept of the botnet. Uh, what exactly, as a mechanical matter, are we talking about with botnets? Who wants to jump on that one? Okay. Is there a representative from Microsoft? That's right. <laughs> yeah. The law, uh, but I am still a lawyer, so uh, I'm not going to go in deep. Uh, uh, I learned uh, on the job, so to speak. Uh, the way I mean, the way I look at botnets and the way I explain it to courts is basically it's, it's malicious code. It's, uh, it's, it's a code that... Uh, its objective is to, you know, land on your computer. Uh, anybody's computer it could be an enterprise or, or a regular consumer. Uh, surreptitiously installs itself uh, for the purpose of being able to re be remotely controlled by a bot herder, the person who developed the code or purchased the code, and will be able to run different types of actions on that machine without the user knowing. And it could be anything. It could use that machine and maybe a hundred or a million others. Uh, to uh, direct a DDoS attack at against, against a particular company or against a particular uh, uh, website. 
uh, it can extract information from that individual computer by uh, installing a keylogger, uh, thereby getting people's uh, financial information or account and uh, wire transferring thousands of dollars. So it really is a nasty piece of, uh, of code that usually is a RAT, remote access tool, that once it's on there, it basically takes control of that machine without the user knowing. What are some of the, the typical ways in which the, the codes disseminated and spread wide enough to actually form a, a, a serious net? You know, we, we've seen it all. Uh, one of the, 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 the most interesting and the, the most effective ways of spreading botnet code is, uh, is basically through the uh, social networks. Uh, you know, everybody loves to see the dancing dog with the hat. Look, hey, I got the dancing dog with the hat <laughs> video. Uh, let me click on it. Boom, if you don't have the right antivirus, if it's not updated, if, if your computer's not patched, if for some whatever reason you, you've missed uh, uh, one of either Microsoft patch or iOS patch, whatever it may be, uh, there's a possibility of now you've just uh, downloaded some of that code onto your machine. If you get an email, a phishing attack or a whaling, if you happen to be a higher up in a corporate uh, environment and you think it's an email from, uh, from the accounting department uh, and you click on a link and Again, you may, you may get infected that way. So there are numerous ways, but the vast majority of them seem to be by social engineering. Yeah, I, you, you really just kind of made the point I want to drill down on, but I think it's important enough to, to go over it again. Um, so here at the University of Texas, where we have, I, I think, a really terrific approach to making, making sure whether people have good habits or not, making sure the systems, the computers on our system are all getting patched uh, relatively rapidly. Um, famously, that's not how it is for a lot of end users out there, especially when they're not part of a, system, uh, a larger system that's taking care of it. How central to the botnet problem is the fact that, you know, my, my friends or family or just people out there just aren't updating and, and taking good hygienic practices to, to deal with patches? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, what, let me give an example. You know, you buy a computer at a, at a, at a retailer, irrespective of, of, of the make. And sometimes it would come pre-installed with certain things, and sometimes it's pre-installed with, with an AV company. Let's say it could be any of the major AV companies, they're all very good, uh, and they give you that trial period. Uh, it's a three month, you, and you're protected, you, you know, you're the consumer, you, don't, you, you might not understand that it's only a three month period, and you have to pay for it thereafter, for example, and they let it lapse. That's very common. Uh, and so they think they have a McAfee, an F-Secure, Semantic, or whatever it may be, but unfortunately they have, it's on the box, but it's not updated, so you don't have the latest signatures. That's one of the ways that a consumer might fall into a trap of thinking that he or she's protected, when in reality they're not. Or if they don't have the automatic updates on. Well, and of course that ties into the, the, pro the larger problem of unlicensed software and uh, yeah. widespread use of that. You know, th there's always that, you know, I don't want to make this into an IP discussion, obviously, into uh, uh, you know intellectual property discussion. That's that's not the area where I where I where I ne my team necessarily functions, but it is a concern. It's a concern from the perspective that even when you look at unlicensed software, we have seen situations in the past. For example, in the Nitol case, and we could get into drill down into that a little bit later, which was one of the operations that we, we that we did was the Nitol botnet, where individuals would purchase computers, brand new computers. Uh, in a third, in a, in, in a in or foreign country, uh, and out of the box, those computers came with counterfeit software, okay? But the problem is that the counterfeit software was also preloaded with, with malware, which happened to connect to a command and control center. So supply chain, you know, counterfeit or unlicensed software, uh, we've seen that criminals will monetize that in numerous ways, and one of the ways that they'll seek monetization, not only in selling the actual counterfeit to make money and not having to pay royalties or license fees, but they'll also maybe get a third party to pay them to install some malware on that box. Sean, can I ask you to talk about, um, in, in general terms, who, who, can you sketch the landscape of, landscape of who gets involved in, in creating these systems? What's, what's, what does that look like? Are we talking ever about uh, state actors? Are we talking entirely about criminal actors? Um, can you give us a picture of, of who's behind it? It can be all of the above. Um, and so certainly there's a large, um, a, a large significance of foreign actors who are involved in these. Uh, and many times it is criminal actors. These are sort of a, a, a relatively cost-effective way to potentially steal a lot of money, steal a lot of important information. And so it runs the gamut. Um, I think mostly what the Bureau's been dealing with and focusing on when we're talking about botnet specifically has been criminally motivated. And again, it's that you know, I can go rob one bank and face a lot of risks if I'm doing that in person in the, the meat world, as my NSA colleagues would say. Uh, but if I want to set up a large-scale dispersed 
global botnet uh, by which um, I can obfuscate my own identity and those that I'm working with and hide behind uh, layers of anonymity. Uh, it's a very effective tool to accomplish what, in, in, in an essence, uh, in, in large part, is just general crime, just theft, stealing. You mentioned obscuring their identity. Um, how much variation is there in the sophistication of these actors in terms of how they do that and, and related to that, how they're controlling the, the net? Yeah, it's really, it, it's interesting and it's alarming how quickly and how much more sophisticated botnets have become just in the last few years. And so one of the first large-scale botnet takedowns that the FBI and DOJ were involved in was the core flood botnet takedown, which was just in 2011. Um, l again, just speaking from a lawyer's perspective, that was a pretty simple botnet. It involved thousands of computers, yet at the same time it had sort of an old-school command and control structure where you actually had a few physical servers on which the uh, bot herders were operating and actually commanding and controlling their bots. Um, now, uh, and more recently, uh, you've read in the press, uh, the, I think it was in 2013, another more recent, and again, just in a two-year period, the FBI was involved with uh, some industry partners and others in the Game Over Zeus botnet takedown. That botnet was extremely sophisticated, where the domains were controlling the bots were being uh, automatically generated by algorithms, switching quickly and diversified. It was a peer-to-peer -peer structure. It wasn't relying upon reaching back to a home computer that if we find it, we can kind of cut off the head of the hydra and go from there. Um, so from a technical perspective, the botnets are becoming much more sophisticated, much harder for us to identify and track, especially from a law enforcement perspective, and then also more technically difficult uh, to actually clean up. So if you're talking about um, who what the role is, and I think that's probably for later in the conversation, how you're actually, what is actually taking down a botnet look like? What does that involve? Um, uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later. Can you tell me anything about the market for, for uh, gaining access? So I'm, I'm a disgruntled employee or for whatever reason I have my beef. I don't have the know-how to, to create this, but I, I know that I would love to have the ability to launch a DDoS at somebody. Um, where do I go? How do I do it? What does this cost? Yeah. I just well, I don't know if I can really tell <laughs> everyone I, I love all my employer. specific information. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't, you don't, you don't, it's not a secret. Just, just, just go, I just did it. I just, uh, All right, I'll I let Greg just, give I just Greg, Googled, what's the latest news I just the Googled. Center for Democracy. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, that's not good. That's not good. I just Googled, There's a ticker I just this. Googled rent a botnet. Okay, here's what came up. Where to rent a botnet for $2 an hour or buy one for $700? A 2012 article. Yeah. And it, it's, mean, so it's really alarming because that, market. it is, it is easily available, <laughs> it's <laughs> relatively cheap, and it's funny, you run the gamut from folks who are actually uh, pretty complex criminal uh, organizations that are using these for those purposes, but then you have gamers in the gaming community who want to go run a, a botnet to go DOS somebody that they don't like uh, on the other side of their, uh, their game they're playing. So it really runs the gamut, and so the Bureau's focus is really, like, it, it's a large-scale problem. And so we've traditionally been focused on the large, big Citadel botnet, Core Flood, Game Over Zeus, things like that, Crypto Locker, these large scale bots that have really significant financial implications. So that's in that we're talking earlier about resource allocation and, and trying to decide what do we focus on. That's where our focus has been, but the problem is, is small and large and all over the place. I'm curious about the, the scale that counts as big over time, and I'm, I'm sure it's, it's got to have changed over time. These days, how many machines or boxes need to be uh, in, in the net to, to make it count as, as a, a substantial one? It's probably less dependent on the size of the bot, but more the damage that's being done. Um, and so typically, a larger bot with more computers and, yeah. and more infected computers is going to do more damage. So there's not a magic number, but it's usually going to be based on uh, the actual cost of what, it, what it's accomplishing. Okay. I, I just want to just so they get, get an idea of what we're looking at in terms of, of how organized these, these folks are. And they're pretty, they're pretty, pretty organized. I mean, they're, they're business people. Uh, uh, and you just mentioned the Citadel. Citadel was, it was an interesting, it was an interesting uh, botnet. Uh, they were really organized. They, you know, they had a helpline. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you could actually, you know, email them and say, like, you know, I purchased your bot. It's not working. And they would help you and, you know, set it up, set it up. Uh, they actually had a little trademark, which was a, uh, it was a, a castle. And there was a little dragon with a little cape and fire coming out of the mouth. And, and, and they actually had uh, keys. I mean, you know, we have, like software companies have keys. They had a key that would drill down into the MAC address of that machine. In other words, if you got, it's not like you get a, a copy of Windows or Office and then you want to, you know, uh, no, they, it's on the machine. So once you bought their, their bot uh, OS, 
and you could only use it on on that apple if you wanted another one you had to go back and they really tracked it really well and they had options for example modules there was a base kit at uh, six hundred and fifty dollars uh, if you wanted real-time monitoring of a financial transaction where they'll manipulate what the person saw on the screen while they're exfiltrating money, you would pay another $250. So these are really, really sophisticated criminal organizations. Was there any one early episode that crystallized awareness of, uh, both in industry and in the government of the significance of this problem, that maybe Conficker? I mean, I, I, I can only say my, my, my personal story. Okay. Uh, oh. Uh, that I got to Microsoft uh, just a couple of months before Configure uh, hit, and my team was working on Configure. I was still trying to find out where, where you know, where my office was. I, I just literally got to the to Microsoft, and I saw them running around, and I was, tr I was still trying to get, you know get my sea legs. Uh, but it was clear to me that it was an issue, and I remember having a conversation with some of the uh, the investigators and the technical folks. Uh, as being the, you know, I'm supposed to be, their, you know, I'm running this team, but I'm like the only lawyer, but else is all technical, and then here I am. So I just wanted them to explain to me what the problem was. Uh, and when they explained it to me and I asked them, do, is there anything technical that you could do to ameliorate this problem, to do something about the problem? And they said, yes. I said, and then my next question is, okay, why haven't you done it yet? And of course, <laughs> what came, the next words that came out of the engineers were for, you know, really hit home for the lawyer was, well, the lawyer said we shouldn't touch anything. So <laughs> that was my first experience with, with botnets. And at that point, I really wanted to understand, well, what can we do to address the problem? And that's how we got involved. Do you remember and can you say what that particular thing was they wanted to do? Well, there's a lot of things that they wanted to do, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of things, in fact, we said, no, <laughs> you can't do. Uh, but, the, but the perspective is, you know, it, it, as a trial lawyer, yeah, I'm a pretty pragmatic guy. I'm not an academic by any stretch of the imagination, but I just wanted to understand the problem. What's the problem, and how does it how does it work, and uh, and what what's what would be the business value to our customers uh, if we did something about it, and and just then do an analysis legally as to what can we do. There's a certain amount of risk in everything in life. The question is, how much risk are you willing to take? And what's the return on investment if something goes wrong or if something goes right? Okay. Now, I, I think we've kind of covered the ground in terms of framing what we're talking about and, and getting everyone up to speed a little bit. Um, before I move on, I, I'm curious, uh, do any of you have a favorite book that's on? Because there's a little cottage industry of books about these types of stories. Has anybody ever read anything you thought, you know, this is a good uh, sort of a, a tale of, of technical forensics and, and activity to try to chase something down? Anybody want to recommend anything? Surely somebody in the room has written that oh, book. I'll let someone else do it. All right. <laughs> Alan's got a book. You should get it. <laughs> uh, all right, let's turn, let's turn to, to the practicality and the legal architecture of a takedown. And, and I'll throw it open. Who wants to begin to walk us through the process of, and let's try to do it sequentially, almost, you know, let's have a hypothetical case. What, what is likely to happen first? Is it the private sector speaking up? Is it is it something governmental that's going to detect what's happening here? Well, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of thoughts and like there from the others as well. But typically with the Bureau, you know, we've found, especially recently, that the research community in the private sector has a lot more expertise, frankly, and uh, sort of institutional knowledge when it comes to actually researching and tracking specific botnets. You know, so we actually had, when we worked on the Game Over Zeus botnet takedown, we were working hand in hand with some researchers from uh, one particular gentleman from Dell SecureWorks, who was sort of viewed as the world's number one expert on the Game Over Zeus botnet, which, you know, coming into this, I didn't know that thing existed. And so we've definitely learned that for us, knowing what's out there, knowing what's causing damage, and working with the folks who are involved in that community are essential for us. And so. There's going to be that general awareness. I think the research community, as I understand things, has a good understanding of the landscape that's out there. What's actually, what are some of the significant botnets, um, and which are ones we can actually possibly do something about. Do we know enough to actually take the, uh, the legal, the technical, and whatever other measures would be needed uh, to take that down? So typically, there's going to be cooperation initially with industry um, and academia even, who are experts on the subject. And then for the Bureau, it's an issue of just prioritization of resources, coming up with a plan, and then trying to effectuate that for the purposes of actually what legal tools 
and technical tools do we need to utilize to actually try to deconstruct that? And so that's a general overview. I can go to more of the specifics, but I didn't know if anybody else had anything else they wanted to throw out. Jesse, you want to jump in on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, at Microsoft, what we, we, we take a look at the problem, and we, there's multiple ways of, of looking at the problem. First of all, you know, we do have our own antivirus department, the Microsoft Malware Protection Center, which is a you know, Defender product. And uh, we take a look and see trends. Okay, what are, what, what are we seeing from in terms of our customers? What are we protecting our customers from? Uh, now remember, what you're doing, you're protecting people from, from uh, attacks. So if they're running your, your, your antivirus, it stops it, it blocks it, and then you know. And then you have an idea, well, what's, what's, what's new, what's coming up, and you start seeing some trends. And then you work closely with, uh, with enterprise customers and say, well, what, what, what's impacting enter enterprise customers? And, 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 the, and in our case, we worked very closely with FSI SAC in the financial sector. Uh, and they kept on talking about things such as Zeus, Citadel, SpyEye, mm -hmm. Ice9, you know, uh, uh, Shylock, Kapaw, all these financial Trojans. So we take a look at those and say, okay, let's pick a target that would have the biggest impact uh, to protect our ecosystem and the people that use it and our enterprise customers, but at the consumer level. And that's how we pick our targets. You mentioned uh, FSI SAC. Can you talk about, for the group sure. who don't know, what, what an ISAC is in, in the financial services uh, example of it? It's, it's, it's basically the industry group. An ISAC is basically uh, uh, an industry group, uh, anything academic. You know, there's a REN ISAC, which are the universities. F FSI SAC is about five to 6,000 banks internationally, mm -hmm. both domestic and international, that exchange information on threats. No personal information, just pure threat information. Hey, you know, uh, SHA values, you know, you know, samples of malware and telemetry, uh, and they exchange that information. So when we started looking at, hey, we want to do it, make, have a big impact and, and help our enterprise customers, and we looked towards the financial sector, they directed us towards FSI SAC, and we were able to work with them, compare what they were seeing, what were attacking their networks, and then we started looking at our telemetry and said, well, what are we protecting our customers from? And then when we saw, okay, this is a great target, we'd work with them uh, in the investigative phase to be able to deconstruct the, the malware and have an understanding of, of how, it, how it infected the devices and how it was controlled. So and that's, I just want to throw out one thought. That, that coordination is key because I, I hope everyone believes this uh, in the room. And no mean comments to me, not because I work for the FBI, but my mom's <laughs> watching, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> The visibility and the access to information that industry has is vastly, un it's, it's unparalleled when it comes to the government side. We, we do not have the access, we do not have the visibility, whether you're talking about your antivirus companies who are collecting information from their customers that help them identify, uh, have a good footprint of the, the landscape of this actual bot or whatever you're trying to, to go after, it's essential. And so this is the issue if we're calling botnets a problem, which I think they are and they can be, and if we're gonna do something uh, about it. We do really rely upon that sort of cooperation and information sharing from private sector to government because we just don't have the visibility uh, that a lot of our industry partners do. So you said the magic words information sharing and I want to bring Greg and Kristen into the conversation. Greg, when you start thinking about private public cooperation, information sharing, perhaps information about uh, customers, maybe involved here, threat signatures, personally identifiable information, is. Do you have any heartburn in thinking about what look, this could mean for privacy? Um, yeah, look, I, I have some heartburn, um, but I, I have to say, I, I think um, when it comes to um, cyber and what information can be shared to deal with cybersecurity problems, I think the privacy community has been very reasonable in what they've asked for. And they've said things, certainly we have, that there is going to be cases where personal information has to be shared to deal with a problem. Um, all we ask is that it be narrowly defined. Uh, and that it actually be used um, for that problem and not for, for other problems. So, you know, uh, information flows from the private sector to the government to deal with a problem like botnets. Um, when then the government shouldn't be able to turn it around and use it for unrelated um, things. And that was one of the issues in the cybersecurity bill. So, for example, um, what was one of the crimes that they could... Oh, um, um, there's a crime of... Uh, of um, uh, uh, flying over a protected military base and taking pictures. You probably didn't know that was a crime, but it is. Um, um, and uh, one of the crimes for which this information shared for cybersecurity reasons could be used was that, which makes no sense, right? It's not, it's not really gonna ever, ever happen. Um, but just the idea that you'd open up um, the use of the information <coughs> to go beyond cyber 
um, to prosecute um, unrelated crimes was was troubling. So the, the Area 51 Protection Act. <laughs> uh, and the other the other thing, and and we actually won this battle um, um, a couple of years before, which was, if the information shared for cyber reasons, could it be used for unrelated national security reasons? So there are cyber national security reasons you might want to use information. Privacy people said that's fine. But if it's unrelated to cyber, it's not. And we actually won that battle about two years ago before uh, the latest round. Okay, Kristen, did you want to jump in? Yeah, well, let me just pick up on um, themes that were touched on in the last panel. And I think what, what Sean and Richard just illustrated is part of what makes Botnet so interesting to me is the fact it is this nature of the partnership and the really deep collaboration from the very beginning of the investigation of the Botnet. We were talking in the last panel about sort of the, the role of government, the role of the private sector in, in these sort of cybersecurity scenarios. And this is one where it seems like the role the private sector is playing is, is really as a force multiplier for the government. They're bringing the government information, and the government without that information wouldn't have the resources to investigate itself and to take action. But it raises, I think, interesting questions because you do have private actors that are essentially prompting sort of criminal action by the government in a way that's, that's really unusual. The government doesn't usually need quite this level of assistance, I think, from the private sector uh, in sort of initiating criminal investigations. So when I think about the, the command and control aspect, which is so central to, to taking down the net, um, I'm wondering, it, I assume at some point in the, in the evolutionary cycle of botnets, you, you could count on there being basically one. you got to find it, but there's one. I, is that still the case, or is it much more complicated than that? No, as I alluded to earlier, the, the command and control infrastructure, and it's, it's probably changed since I was last heavily involved in one of these, the, these takedowns, is they're, they have moved to peer-to-peer -peer networks, which again are, uh, typically there's a domain that is part of the command and control infrastructure that's actually talking to the bots, telling them what to do, what not to do, et cetera. Well, those domains are now being generated automatically by algorithms that they're gonna change uh, almost instantaneously and they're gonna they're cycle through that. So trying to find where the botnet is, who it's talking to, and what actually that command and control infrastructure is, is much more difficult. And so, um, you know, the key sort of legal issues that the Bureau has to um, deal with in the Department of Justice when we're, we're trying to uh, effectuate a botnet disruption um, are really sort of implications of the surveillance laws in the United States because we're going to have to, we're going to have to find out which computers are talking to which computers um, once we've identified how to communicate of the bot. Um, and then also, what are we going to do to disrupt it? Exactly. And that's going to include things like seeking injunctive relief, um, uh, possibly for violations of the Wiretap Act, um, and possibly seizing if there are, is actual hard infrastructure that we can put our hands on. Um, and then the other part of the legal issues for us are the, the human aspect. Can we actually find out who's behind this and put cuffs on someone? And so that's, that's sort of the, the layered themes of the issues we typically have to deal with. Obviously, the constitutional implications of you know, the seizures and things like that are also very important, obviously. But um, that's sort of the three layers, I think, of, of legal issues we have to work through. And it makes it complicated when you're not just talking about a few computers you can easily point to, but a distributed multinational uh, entity that is going to require not just input and applicability of U.S. laws, but also foreign laws and foreign law enforcement cooperation. So, so who might we imagine would be the object or the recipient of that injunctive relief? I mean, who's that directed to and towards what end? So... It, it can depend. Typically, what we've done, and maybe Richard will like to talk a little bit about the, the Citadel. Would you like to talk about Citadel a little bit and how that worked from the civil what, injunctive side? We wanted to do the growth bot, which I think is the most recent one, which is the one that we finished in December. Uh, I think that, and that, was a, that was a great, you know, uh, public-private partnership. Uh, a dork bot, you know, really kind of uh, is like the evolution of where we are now. When we started the program years ago, it's about eight years ago at Microsoft now. You know, uh, you looked at the command and control structure, uh, was overwhelmingly within the United States. Why? Because they have great infrastructure. You know, they're business people, they want their infrastructure always up. They want their, you know, they want to be able to reach their bots whenever they can. Uh, and they really, you know, criminals never had to worry about someone ripping their infrastructure away. They figured, all I got to do is get on your box. Once I'm there, it's cool, no problem. You know, then I could do my thing. Uh, when we started doing some of these takedowns and these actions in, cooper in, in collaboration with uh, not only domestic law enforcement agencies like the FBI, but international ones like Europe's EC3 and Interpol, they started dispersing their infrastructure.
and they started spreading it around around all around the world, basically. And in Dorkbot, which we we uh, which we uh, had a hand in uh, with uh, the FBI, it was FBI run, and we assisted the FBI and uh, several several other agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we uh, there were uh, domains that were seized in the United States, uh, civilly, uh, and then there were actual servers that were seized criminally, not only in the United States but in Canada, in about uh, I think uh, over 25 jurisdictions. So it's gotten extremely complex uh, in terms of the infrastructure that they're utilizing. They've hardened their infrastructure and they dispersed their infrastructure, and they, and they've encrypted everything. So. Everything, all the communications that even within the bot themselves are all encrypted. How hard is it to get that injunction if you want to seize the domain? Well, the, the, from a, if it's a civil, you know, we, we uh, in Dorkbot it was a part civil, part criminal. In our our particular part, which is a civil case, we really have to make sure, uh, and this is something that we do a lot of work on, even with industry partners and some of our academic partners, to make sure that the domains are in fact domains that are used by the criminals. The, the worst possible thing that could happen is that you take a domain down that's a compromised domain and you have collateral damage. Uh, obviously, from Microsoft's perspective, we don't have sovereign immunity. Uh, you know, the li there's liability issues there that you have to be very, very uh, aware of. Uh, so you really have to prove to the court, you know, uh, uh, that's not necessarily technical, but in such a way that is detailed enough to demonstrate why is that domain being used criminally and who's behind the domain. So we do a lot of research and a lot of analysis. Would it be better for the government then to be going into court, you know, precisely for the reason you suggest? There is some risk if you get it wrong. Better if it's the government that's going and asking for this. And the government has, I, mm -hmm. and there have been situations where the government has asked for for uh, for seizures of uh, for domains. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. No, that's correct. And it's it, again speaking to the partnership. Obviously, Microsoft and other companies may have an interest in doing that themselves because one. If they're already investigating it and they have civil options available by which they can actually effectuate an outcome that it's good for its customers and its product, um, I know that in even instances where they have done that, there has typically been coordination. I think that's been key because, again, it's a shared threat. I don't know if that's the right word, a shared problem. And so I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it sounds a little cliche, but our, uh, our director and assistant director always talk about the all tools approach. And so, Whatever we can bring to bear, sort of this force multiplier to go after the problem, I think is beneficial. One of the real positive aspects of doing it when it, when it comes to a civil case and, and on the civil side for Microsoft, once you get that injunctive relief and you know 14 days later and then ultimately you seize it, you request uh, permission to then sync the information. You know, one of the unique aspects of, of the entire legal proceeding or legal process on the civil side is do you have the appropriate standing? And of course, if you're looking at malware that's specifically targeting Windows malware, clearly Microsoft has standing since they're trespassing on our OS, you know, trespass to chattels. We use very basic, you know, common law principles in our pleadings. They're, they're open, they're unsealed. We have about 14 or 15 cases thus far in several different districts. So that information is very important. Those, you know, we identify IP addresses only, and I want to be very specific about that. We only get IP addresses. We geolocate those IP addresses. And then we have a very robust program because my job is to protect my customers. So I need to notify them as victims and then remediate those boxes, clean those boxes. Now, they're all over the world. So we have a process where we geolocate Brazil. Brazil cert gets theirs. UK cert, you get theirs. Germany cert, you get theirs. And then we work with them, providing them the tools, which is free, but they could use whatever tools they wish to use to notify those victims and clean those computers. So I was looking up one of the takedowns that Microsoft did, this no IP one, mm -hmm. where um, you, you got would, criticized. You, you wouldn't take that one. Yeah, well, <laughs> I just want to, because because it, it does illustrate the issues, and, and let's let's start getting into some of the tougher ones. Like uh, in the no IP case, there uh, it looks like you were 99 percent overbroad according to the EFF analysis, <coughs> and you knocked a bunch of people off the internet, and I got to imagine some of them lost money and. It's really, you know, if you're a business, it's really hard to be off the internet for, for even a few hours. People, they just, nowadays they just don't have attention spans and they just won't keep coming back to you if they didn't get to you um, um, the first time they go somewhere else. So what happened to all those folks who lost money? Did you give them any money, any compensation well, back? Well, uh, you know, the, the, you're, you're reading one particular article from one particular perspective. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, I read a couple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the NoIP case was unique in the sense that we 
there was a technical there was a technical error because then it was very different. It wasn't a domain. It was a it was a dynamic do domain provider. So what had worked previously in two other operations unfortunately failed for some technical reasons. And for I believe it was a I, it was a relatively short period of time. People using the free service from OIP were offline because they were they, basically it was a subdomain. And then uh, the objective there was to get them online as fast as possible. Uh, now the flip side, and and, and we and, well, and wait, 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 wait. What did you pay them for knocking them offline? Uh, there, there was there was no uh, when the people that actually reached out to Microsoft and we explained them as to why and what happened, uh, nobody uh, came forward. They uh, they understood that the objective was to protect them, that the malware was being uh, targeting them, and we explained to them what happened. So no IP. What they said was, if you had come to us and and told us what you wanted to do and given us notice, we could have protected those people. We could have given you what you needed to do this. Now, you know, I think uh, there's some disagreement between <coughs> us and OIP. I think we've reached a, a good resolution, which is a, a sealed resolution. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did pay someone. He did pay someone. <laughs> you're, assuming, you're, uh, you're assuming a lot of things there. Uh, all I could say is that, you know, the objectives were to protect quite a few people. Uh, there was a particular piece of malware. And I think, I, and if you uh, go on and uh, being, uh, being the uh, the 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 malware, the Vlada Bindi in Chengsis, uh you can take a look and see uh, you know wh what it's currently doing now. But the objective was to stop the propagation of the malware, which basically was a remote access tool. And one of the things that really I found shocking about the malware, and one of the reasons why we wanted to to try to impact the malware and, and and disrupt it as soon as possible, was the fact that it. It was a, ma a, a way for the bot herders, which sold it, and there are quite there are literally hundreds of versions out there, to be able to turn on your computer, uh, your camera, and your microphone, and they would then give you tutorials on YouTube demonstrating young ladies who, are in their rooms, unknown to them, were being videoed and were being recorded. Uh, so I mean, we had our the interest. Things went wrong for about 24, 48 hours until we connected. You're right, but. The objective always was to protect the people that were being abused by that particular piece of matter. Right, I, it's a it's a good objective a, objective. But Richard, uh, so when 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 we were when you were talking um, at Microsoft a couple years ago, um, and I, by the way, I, I find the whole legal theory fascinating because you're you're pulling in this uh, uh, very ancient um, um, doctrine in order to facilitate a very modern uh, um, goal. Um, I, I understood that you that Microsoft puts up a bond when it seeks the orders. Is that correct? And yes. if so, what are the circumstances under which a person who does get errantly knocked offline for a time can get access to that uh, to those funds? Well, a bond's always put up when you have an extraordinary order. If you look at ex parte TRO, there's a bond requirement. We always put up a bond. Uh, but, but if for some reason there's if there's ever any if there's ever any issue in terms of something that we do. That impacts anybody, uh, we, we they could just reach out to us directly. I'll give you an example. Sometimes, uh, one of the things that's very difficult to do is when you're re doing a uh, analysis of, of malware and they're using domains. Is it could be a domain of an academic or a researcher who, uh, for whatever reason, he or she doesn't put enough information to who is, so that you could identify that it's 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 not a a malicious domain. They're simply looking at traffic. It's hard to tell. Since the beginning of the program, we've gotten much, much better in deconflicting that with known researchers and known other companies that do this type of work. But there were times when you would take down a sinkhole that was a researcher, and some of them said, hey, what are you doing? And of course, the minute they called us up and they would be able to demonstrate, hey, this is an academic project, we would immediately put it back on and had an arrangement to make sure that they had the visibility to continue their to, the, to continue their research. So there are ways that people would be able to reach out to us if there's an issue. Uh, luckily, uh, now, you know, unfortunately, no IP was wa was the only one where we had an issue that some people were taken offline, and and it was regrettable. Um, let me just let me just ask the question one more time. You put up a bond. Under what circumstances can a person get access to compensation because they were errantly knocked offline through that bond? You would have to file with the court. But what what do you have? You, you file with the court, you say, I was harmed, and then it's automatic? I mean, what do you got to no, do? No, there's a process you have to go through. The bond, you know, th that's the bond you would have to file, you know, go to court, 
file a notice, and then you have to, to plead before the court that you should uh, have access to the bond for whatever damages you're seeking, and you have to prove the damages. And, and I'm sorry to do this, but for, for that no IP case, how big was the bond? Well, the bond varies. I mean, it's a public record. It could go anywhere from, uh, you know, $250,000 to $500,000. Uh-huh. It just, it, I, I just worry about this case in particular because it did seem like a lot of people suffered a little harm, right? Some people probably suffered more harm than other people did. Nobody got paid, and that makes it so that there's not as much incentive as one might want to uh, ensure that harm doesn't happen. Perhaps it's a class action, which we don't really have many class actions anymore, so maybe that's moved. Yeah, Kristen, you were going to jump in. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, one interesting thing about the, the legal theory that has come up as well in the last panel is this is all happening, all these takedowns are happening either with Microsoft or to the government under court supervision, which is rare for a number of cybersecurity sort of actions. Um, all the filings are public. You can, what is it, botnet legal notice dot com, right. you can go fully about the internet. Um, but they are still ex parte, and that's I think goes to Greg's point that mm -hmm. in the the domain owners that you're you're going after, the, the bot operators, mm -hmm. are for very good reason not notified ex ante, but the result is that none of them still are coming in, as far as I know, and challenging any of these takedowns really ex post either. So we talked about the, the legal theories, and um, you know, the, I think the DOJ at various points has actually referred to this as creative lawyering. But what we're seeing is these sort of seriatim district court, uh, um, you know, like district courts around the country allowing the botnet takedowns. But it's not clear to me how you would ever get up to the circuit court to get sort of higher level legal precedent ratifying these legal theories. So uh, I'm curious to the two of you, whether you think we'll stay in this sort of domain of creative lawyering and scattered district court opinions, or is there a sort of forward strategy to get higher court precedent on these issues? Well, I refer to it as clear and concise <laughs> legal uh, lawyering. Um, <laughs> Richard, thank you. Um, no, that's a, it's a good question, and I don't know. And, th and the thing is, is that I, I, I think the issue with so many of these problems, when we're trying to address whatever the issue may be in cyberspace, and you're having to go to courts. I think in this, I think we've, we've structured fairly effective legal theories that I, I think fit what we're trying to accomplish. This, these bad things are happening by and being conducted by actors who either are nameless and faceless or are in a country that is not friendly with us. And so they're probably not going to come in, the actors, to challenge these in court. Um, I don't have an idea as to how or why, uh, how to effectuate sort of a higher level review, though, just given that's sort of the realities of what we're dealing okay. with. I, it's a fair question, though. I mean, uh, Let's, I, I guess really the ultimate question is, do we prepare the cases as if someone is going to go and show up? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone shows up, we are prepared to litigate, and we feel very confident in our case. Uh, now, you have to look at the analysis. I think our case is so strong in the sense that we know we do a hell of a lot of research. Uh, we have a lot of evidence, and we have both private and academic partners many times with us that no one has shown. And I think that says a lot about the preparation of the file. It's all public. And I think we go into very, very specific detail as to why we're doing it, what the infrastructure is, and uh, what the impact is in terms of not only against Microsoft, but more importantly, uh, I think society in general. Uh, they just hap they happen to be our customers, uh, but there is a societal impact. There's a public good involved in it as well. Are there any risks or dangers involved with the status quo approach to how we're handling this beyond the one that Greg has highlighted, that those who are knocked off improperly uh, for some time? Do you see other problems from that perspective? Or let me broaden the question and, and open it up also to the rest of the room if other people have views. What, what I've heard is it's a dynamic challenge, and we have a dynamic evolving response. And we're largely on top of it at this point, so it sounds like maybe things are fine from the government's perspective. The problems are real, as Greg points out, but maybe nothing too drastic has happened yet. So are we good? Everything's fine as it is? Or is there a need to address either the efficacy of the takedown or the protection of, of the bystanders who might be harmed? I'll take silence as everyone loves the status quo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I'll just very briefly, I think it's, it's the question of scale. I mean, uh, we're, we're looking at, we, we've, we've been very fortunate, we've done uh, in collaboration with our industry and, and law enforcement partners, uh, I want to say 15 now, which is quite a significant number over the past you know, six years or so. But the question is, 
you know, we, Microsoft, you know, can't do it by itself. It's, it's not, you know, we're, we're not out there saying, hey, it's just us, we're gonna do it. The objective is to get other, you know, private partners involved, you know, and we've worked with Symantec, F-Secure, uh, any of the major uh, antivirus security companies, we work closely with them. And obviously, not only with the FBI, but Europe CC3, Interpol, AFP, you know, uh, Japanese. We even work with CNCERT. Uh, so uh, it has to be a public-private approach uh, because I think it's the right way to do it. It's the transparent way to do it, but we have to scale to address the problem. You know, one company on its own cannot scale sufficiently. Uh, and, we, and we're not law enforcement, right? The private sector, our main objectives are we want to stop the harm, protect our customers, and notify them. But there's a huge other part, which is the deterrent, which is the attribution, and that's where law enforcement comes in. So it has to be, you know, a combined approach. So I just, I was curious, and in, in preparation for the panel, I looked up some statistics, and I think this goes to your point about scaling up. So according to McAfee, um, the United States is, I believe, the country, second ranked country in the world for hosting Bionet Command and Control servers. We've got great infrastructure. <laughs> right, exactly. It's, it's, really, it's really effective. Uh, Akamai has reported. <laughs> Cyber um, Ak Akamai has reported that the U.S. is the third biggest source of DDoS attacks after China and Germany. So I mean, clearly scale, taking seriously, of course, Greg's concerns about uh, you know, collateral damage, it does seem like there's been, there's been a lot of effort to go after some of the worst botnets, but there's also a critique that you're sort of playing whack-a-mole and that you can't keep up with the, the evolving threats and the, the sheer numbers, and that seems to be supported at least by some security company research. I know if Microsoft has resource issues addressing it, the FBI certainly <laughs> does. So yeah, it's, it's a real issue. These are the huge problems. And so I don't know that there's a good answer as to is there a different approach? And I think we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, have we done a good measuring? And I think uh, Richard said Microsoft has done this. Are we having that deterrent effect that we're, we're seeking from doing this, especially from a government perspective? How do we know if what we're doing is actually having an effect and actually are, are, the, are the numbers showing that this is actually doing something that we're hoping to achieve. And I don't know that that is the case yet. I think on the specific takedowns, it has been effective in that regard. But when you're having, I mean, that's the, the issue with so much cyber crime is that well, it's the nameless, faceless actor right. behind the computer, um, well, often we, in a foreign country. I don't know about how, how good you're, you are right now because I'm looking at the, I just, I've been following the prices of renting a bot. <laughs> They seem to be going down, and the number of and the number of computers and the number of computers affected is going up. So I'm not sure that we're accomplishing that. Well, then I, I disagree with you. I, I, I disagree with you, but you know, it's it's kind of like you know, I, I hear this all the time: is uh, well, it's whack-a-mole. You don't do anything, but uh, what's the alternative, really? I mean, I mean, what's the alternative? It's like you're not going to eliminate crime. You know, it's it's been around since you know since the biblical times. So what we do is, how do you metric it? You know, as a business, so you have to take a look at well, what impact are you having on it? So there's two ways you could see it. Number one is you look at the fluctuation of the price, and that's a good indicator. Does it go down, does it go up? But, there's some, but it's not that simple. There's some reason why sometimes it dips. If you have a piece of code that you're selling, and now you wanna, you, you wanna come out with a, a, a new version of your, of your bot code, you let that one go open. It, it becomes in, uh, basically a, a, a freeware and you see the price just dump, and then yours, which is now the new one, starts selling for 3,000. So you really gotta take a look at the entire market. The other thing we do is that, okay, as I mentioned earlier, we take a look at who are we protecting, and what's the encounter rate of the particular piece of malware. So once we do an operation, and let's say we say, we look, there's four, five, 10 million unique IPs that the operation uh, has revealed are infected. The next thing we do is look at the encounter rate of those that are running antivirus, we have about 32% of the market, and then we also check with our industry partners, and then we see, well, is the encounter rate going up or down? And what we've seen in Ramnet, which was uh, a joint operation, a uh, public-private partnership operation, after the operation, we saw about, I think it's about uh, seven or eight million unique IPs that were infected. Next month, we started looking at the encounter rate and flatline, <laughs> boom, dead. What that means is, that piece of malware is no longer infecting anybody because you basically have destroyed its infrastructure. Doesn't happen all the time, but there are ways to measure that impact. Now, it's still a problem of scale. We do have to scale up, and I think that the public-private partnership uh, relationship and, 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 uh, and uh, strategy is the only way that we'd be able to do that. Uh, 
Yeah, would you like questions? Uh, so, Bobby, you've done a fantastic job all day of bringing together really smart people, but I noticed there's one important stakeholder that's missing on this panel, uh, which is the net. Uh, and you know, the White House took a stab at bringing together network operators uh, a couple of years ago for the botnet deployed to Conduct, uh, and I know CDT was involved in that. Uh, is there more work that we can do by bringing together stakeholders for sort of voluntary action across the ecosystem? Uh, are there flaws that we can do you know, more work better the next time? Hmm. Thoughts on that? Is the Commerce Department proposing another multi-stakeholder initiative? <laughs> We're here to help. <laughs> but no, I, I, seriously, is there, is there more work that can be done at the network level, or are there other stakeholders that, you know, at the host level uh, that need to be involved, or is this primarily the software and law enforcement? Uh, 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 real quick, uh, we've, we've been working very closely with ISPs around the world. Uh, and, and when I say well, one, of the, one of the byproducts of what we get is we just get a unique IP. So we know, hey, if that unique IP, which we've taken down or disrupted this, this malware, hits our sinkhole, we know for a fact it's not behavioral, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not heuristics. We know that the computers behind that unique IP are infected, period. Then we take a look at the ASN range, IP range. It belongs to ISP provider A. We reach out to them. You know, we work closely with the, with the ISPs, both domestically and internationally, because my objective is, that's your client. We don't know who it is, but you know that on this date, that time, who is on that computer, they're infected. Here's that information. Now, and each ISP treats it differently. We had some ISPs that would use a walled garden approach. Other I ISPs actually called their customers individually on the phone. Uh, they had different ways of doing it, but we, you know, yeah, yeah they, but, it, but they did it. So. So I think that you know the industry coming together in, in terms of e and working with the ISPs and, and, and certs, we've been doing that, and that's really part of, of, of our program at Microsoft to to work with the ISPs, and they've done a pretty good job, at least in the times that we've worked with them. Uh, I just throw you know to the extent that the, the most complicated factor I think for the government, Richard, please tell me if I'm I'm off base here, is that the cleanup piece, the actual remediation action. So when we're talking about malicious code that still remains on computers, despite the fact that Microsoft and whatever companies out there may have been pushing co or pushing patches and asking folks to update and X, Y, Z. And then even after we've had a single operation going on for a year, there's still whatever percentage of the bot that is still out there, possibly to be reconstituted if we just walk away. And so that is the most complicated part. The government has not sort of made the policy decision that we're going to get into the business of actually sending the cleanup code to people's computers at this point. It's something that's been talked about and considered. I don't know that it's something that people want the government to be doing, but that to me is sort of the most challenging one that may require more that, uh, for ISPs and others to help get involved. Because what do you do if, if folks aren't taking the actions that are necessary, if the, the companies or the providers, whoever it may be, um, to, to really clean up what's left behind after everyone else has taken these initial actions to start the, the actual disruption? So of course the, the challenge with the compulsory patch of that kind is who knows what kind of system disruption might fall from that. But some people have suggested what sort of the half measure is you, you either get or compel the ISPs writ large around the country, at least within th those we can, can control or mm -hmm. compel, to uh, bar people from continuing to use the product until they're patched, until, yep. they, until they take care of it themselves. What do you think of that? Tricky. It's not, it, it, it's, I don't know that from a policy perspective there's a right or wrong answer, okay? And it may depend on the botnet. It may depend on the severity of the threat that's being posed by that remaining on the internet. Um, and I think it's a balancing act, and it's going to continue to be. I don't know that that, and that was something we had talked about before um, with some of our botnet takedowns, is, is that an approach we would take, where you have the splash page that says, you can no longer connect to the internet until you download this thing. And then the person behind the computer is like, damn, I'm infected with another botnet. Exactly. <laughs> that's <laughs> so exactly like, what they would Yeah, think. so <laughs> it's, it's a complex like issue. I don't know that that's a perfect solution, yeah. but I don't really have a better one. Uh, this is like the, uh, the, Take the, that the smart hackers Richard. in Europe who noticed <laughs> the pop-up screens about noticing cookies and so yeah. very quickly made a made some malware that took advantage of that. Yep. Greg, what do you think of that idea? Uh, is it too uh, much uh, Pandora's box? Yeah, it does, it does. It seems very um, dangerous. Um, and also just the idea that um, government make a decision that I couldn't use this device until I did something that the government said I needed to do when from my perspective, from my perspective, the device was working just fine. 
I didn't know I was infected. I'm, and, it, and all of a sudden, I, I have to stop because the government said I have to. And uh, really, uh, sometimes I'm doing something very sensitive, something that really needs to be done immediately. Uh, I think that there's that there are problems. And then we also talk about this in our office. Um, how would how would notice happen? Say you gave people three notices, right? No one's going to trust the notices. Yeah. It's really hard to, to do this right. It seems like there's, there's somewhat different issues depending on who is who is taking that approach. Sure. Is it a notice from your ISP or is it a notice from the government? I think people would react potentially quite differently to those those two sort of in, uh, actors uh, targeting them potentially. Maybe but it might depend a little on whether they're Europeans or Americans. Well, I think that that is certainly <laughs> true. Um, I mean, one, one other issue, I mean, in talking about the difficulties of remediation, it seems like another issue on the horizon is uh, the Internet of Things and the interaction with botnets. So I mean, I've seen reports about like the first um, closed circuit television camera botnet, and to the extent that we, we've already talked about the failure to patch sort of systems in general in the Internet of Things, it seems like that's going to be potentially a huge ramp up in, in compromised systems that could be exploited for these in the future, and will pose even more difficult remediation challenges. Yeah, yeah well, one of the you know uh, I'm not gonna, there's one particular country in Europe. Who are uh, you know just like the, the I'm not going to mention the, the, the country, but it, 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 it what they do is amazing though. But again, it's really a cultural thing. Uh, this like a gold or platinum standard of certs. Uh, as I mentioned, part of the program is you want to get this information out. We're not a th we don't s we're not selling threat information. You know, we view those as as victims and yeah. uh, our customers want to clean them and remediate them as fast as as fast as possible. This one particular cert we geolocate it. And, hey, it's in your country. Uh, it works for them. I'm not not and not. I'm not going to be an advocate that it would work here in the United States or anywhere else, but they literally push code on everybody's box, uh, and, and and they clean. And then you know we look at our sync call and say the client, well, 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 it's gone. Okay, so let's look at it, at everybody else's. So there are different ways to do it, but it depends. It's the complexities of the cultural, legally. Uh, so uh, overall, you know, it's it's a learning experience. Uh, we have seen a, an acceleration in in the time with which these boxes have been cleaned over the past six years. So we are going in the right direction, mm -hmm. I think, as a community. Uh, but there's still a lot of work that has to be done. Um, if anyone else out there, we're getting close to the end of time. If anybody has a question, yes, in the back. I'll give the last question and then get out of here. Actually, on time. Um, <coughs> there occasionally are proposals for reforms on the margins of this architecture. Um, a, a proposal, I think, that's working its way through the federal rules process on uh, Rule 41, the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. Uh, Sean, can you clue us in on what's happening there? Uh, it, I think we'll have the last two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> in short, in its various there, the request <laughs> is to basically allow a judge in a single district to issue an order to conduct a remote search across multiple districts. And so when you're talking about the need for this in the context of botnets, it, it sort of makes sense that, look, we can't go to 50,000 different judges and get 50,000 sets of orders. And so it was viewed by the Bureau and the Department as a possible solution uh, or a possible tool that may be beneficial to dealing with botnets and other issues uh, related to cybercrime. Um, I imagine Greg may have some questions well, or thoughts drew, about it. It drew a lot of fire. A lot of the privacy community thought it was overbroad and, and dangerous and would decrease trust. Um, and But it went through as it was uh, proposed, and uh, where it sits right now is it would have to be approved by the Supreme Court. Supreme Court, Court right. Mm -hmm. So it's still got another, I think, year, Supreme Court, and then 
Congress gets a look at it, so 2017. Congress would have to veto it, right? Right, I think that's the so only option, right? Nothing. They do nothing yeah. at passing. Greg, just to sum up, what, what's the biggest danger with, is, is it that some judge remote from a particular community is making a decision that in some way? Well, I think one, one issue is that, is uh, the form of shopping issue that you, if you find that judge who always says yes on this issue, you just keep going to that judge. Um, and, and there's really no mechanism in the uh, rule to prevent that. Uh, and then just the, the decrease in trust, that um, people would worry that, um, these orders would become very uh, common, and that the consequence would be that you just couldn't trust what was going on. Well, it's not Patch Tuesday, but I'm nonetheless inspired to go uh, patch <laughs> my system. And uh, I recommend you all go home and do the same thing. Thank you for spending your day with us, and especially to those online who've been watching, <laughs> thank you. Thank you to the panelists for a very illuminating discussion. <laughs>